everyone. So I'm a PhD student at Cornell working with PJ Government and, um, and looking at heat stress. So uh, I'll be talking about the results of testing a novel system for managing heat stress and lasting in the married house. Can you hear me okay? Is it better if I use the microphone? Okay. Um, uh, yeah, so I won't uh, belabor the um, effects of heat stress. We've heard a lot about that today. Uh, it, the U.S. area industry is a $40 billion industry as of 2014. In 2003, the um, St. Pierre study estimated a 4 to 7% revenue loss um, from the value of the industry in 2013. And um, we, these are some of the heat stress effects that we focused on. You know, as mentioned, it's difficult to measure reproduction or endocrine changes. Those are also longer term things. So this was a seven week study. So uh, we looked at, we measured respiration rate uh, at five times a day, core temperature twice a day, and feed intake and milk production. And so um, when, and evaluating the conductive cooling system, these were the parameters that we used. Uh, so the first objective was measuring the impact of conductive cooling on production and physiological traits. So um, this was the particular conductive cooling system that we built and um, there are several different ways of designing a conductive cooling system so I'll give you a little information on the design we chose as well. And um, I'll also touch a little bit on uh, looking at comparing heat flow and condensation rates um, and even between different types of conductive cooling systems and some preliminary data on economic analysis. And so current practices for heat stress relief, there's shade and fans, which are good to a point. I, mean, I know dairy farmers in New York that will say, well, you know, it's, it's all we need, some of the pasture-based dairy. Um, but the more intensive dairy industry, or if once you get out of upstate New York or other more mild um, climates, then you really need some evaporative cooling systems. The, there's a fan and sprinkler or mister systems, which are probably the most common system, and there's also the corral cool and other fogger systems, which these are more expensive, um, at least according to the companies, they're more effective than fan and sprinkler systems. So I'm mainly focusing on comparing conductive cooling to a control, which was no cooling. Um, but the motivation for conductive cooling is potentially to have another tool to address heat stress. It is not dependent, on, like, conductive cooling will be equally effective in humid as in dry climates. It does not, the relative humidity does not affect the amount of heat that's transferred. So it's potentially useful for hot and humid climates that may not respond as well to evaporative cooling. Um, it, it does use electricity because you have to cool the water, but all of the water is recycled. Um, it's so unlike a mister or a sprinkler system, it doesn't actually consume the water. And uh, sanitation, if you are using a sprinkler system or potentially if condensation occurs in conductive cooling, that increase in moisture can also lead to more uh, mastitis, which can be compounded by less immunity with heat stress, uh, which is why mastitis tends to be higher in the summertime. So in, in this experiment, we went for seven weeks, and we had four experimental and four controlled cows. So these were eight mid-lactation, first lactation Holsteins. And uh, we had two identical climate controlled rooms, and the cows were exposed to eight hours of heat stress from about nine in the morning until five at night. And we moved the cows in at 5.30 in the morning, and then we took, we milked them and then took data on the core temperature, the respiration rate before the heat stress was imposed. Then the cows were cooled, half the cows were cooled, the other half were not cooled, and they were all exposed to a THI of about 81 for eight hours. And there was, which theoretically this is mild to moderate heat stress, but the cows, the control cows were breaking the 101 4.0 threshold for rectal temperature, so the response was actually uh, borderline high to severe stress. I think this is probably, perhaps our cows in New York are not as tough as in other regions, and another possibility is that um, we had basically no airflow in these rooms, so it was 60% relative humidity, um, but we had ventilation rate of eight air changes per hour, but we did not have any fans, so uh, the cows appear to be more heat stressed than uh, would really be expected given these THIs. Um, and then we tested cooling with both 
4.5 and 10 degrees Celsius water. This is 40 degrees Fahrenheit and 50 degrees Fahrenheit, respectively. And then during the seventh week, we uh, removed the conductive cooling, and in one room, we used sprinklers and sand. Now, this isn't really a simulation of a production system in that these cows were in tie stalls, so they couldn't get away from it. So the, actually, the only data we used from this was the consumption of the how much water the sprinklers consumed. The cows had the lowest rectal temperature in this treatment, but it wasn't really realistic in that in a production setting, it's going to be on the feed line. The cows won't be forced to stand under it the whole time. Uh, and then in the other room, we put the water beds directly on concrete to test if this sort of passive conductive cooling would have a measurable effect. So this shows the system design. So there, there were two uh, pairs of these systems because we had four cows that were cooled. And for each system, we had a reservoir and a chiller. So the water was recirculated in the reservoir and then a separate system picked up the chilled water and pumped it um, through the water beds. These were BCC water beds bought from Advanced Comfort Technologies, but we did modify them. They're intended to be uh, like bolted down to the concrete and installed as a static system. So uh, we did that with half of them. Actually, all the beds had insulation underneath of them, and the control beds had no cooling. The experimental beds had valves installed, and then water was pumped through at the rate of 3.5 gallons per minute. This shows the data collection. So we had no production and feed refusals were measured twice a day. And um, skin temperature and sweating rate, the skin temperature was measured five times a day, the sweating rate twice a day, also rectal temperature twice a day. And I, th I think I mentioned before, the rectal temperature was measured before the cows were heat stressed and then at the end of the day, like at five o'clock after eight hours of heat stress. We also had the line time monitors and we had thermocouples in several locations to try to understand what was happening with the heat flows. Um, so this shows the milk production data, and you can see the trend that the stronger the cooling, the more milk the cows made. Um, it was, this one was statistically significant uh, compared to the control. The errors were high enough that the 50 degrees Fahrenheit was not statistically significant. Uh, this was a, so this was for the higher heat stress treatment at 81, and this was a 14% difference in milk production from cool to not cool. Uh, for the feed intake, it was a similar trend. Um, in this case, actually, all the cows had higher feed intake in the first week. And um, I think what I forgot to mention, the first week we put the cows in the facility, we did not impose heat stress or have any cooling. So the THI was about 72, so it was actually still would qualify as moderate, as mild stress. Um, but then we, and then in the um, paper that's in the conference proceedings, you can also see it like by percentage, and so we normalized it by the first week performance. Um, and then looked at, so actually all of the cows, for milk, all the cows dropped a little bit in milk production compared to the first week, but I think it was about a 5% drop for the cooled cows, and it was like a 16% or something for the um, control cows. Uh, this shows the respiration rate, so as I mentioned, the cows that were in the control were at 85, which is um, pretty much qualifying as borderline high stress, and um, these, are, these are just kind of general guidelines of 50 and 80, similar to the last presentation, and the, so both of the cooled groups were statistically significantly lower for their respiration rate. Um, likewise, with the rectal temperature, the control cows were at 104.4 for the least squared mean, and these other and the cooled cows were at 102.9 or 102.4. These are all this is um, the least squared means from linear models. So we used the cow and the uh, week as a random effect, and then the fixed effects of the cooling. Um, and then also for the rectal temperature, the respiration rate, um, also the cows individual, both the cows individual average from the first week. And the, that, uh, and the um, daily temperature from that particular morning were used as linear covariance. Because we did have a small group of cows, we were doing repeated measurements on these cows, and so that helped us control for some of the individual variability. And incidentally, one of the more tolerant cows was in, the, ended up, I think what was probably the most heat tolerant cow ended up in the control cow, and the most sensitive cow ended up as an experimental cow. But then we did switch the last week whether they were in the control or experimental group. So we had a fairly complete set of data um, on the every, we had the information for every cow and how she responded to both the cooling and to the control.
Um, so and with the sprinklers, we were looking at like what would be typical for a northeast system. So we talked to Kurt Gooch and said, okay, so you know what do dairy farmers in this area do? So we got from a company in Pennsylvania, we ordered sprinklers like would be used in the northeast, and uh, then we programmed them to be on for one minute, which was enough to soak the cow, be off for 15 minutes, which was what it would take to where her hair start, her hair coat started to dry out, and then she'd be sprinkled again. So the sprinkler water consumption uh, was 30.4 liters um, per nozzle, and this works out to about 3,600 liters per cow per season. If you cool cows for 10 hours per day for 120 days, this was fairly similar to the literature values. Um, I'll show a little later on that actually the cost of buying the water is not a big deal. The cost of buying electricity far outshadows the cost of water. But if you're like in California right now and you simply don't have water, then you have a problem. So it's not, the water doesn't end up being that big of a function of the economic analysis. It's more a sanitation concern or a water scarcity resource use concern. Um, and then also when we place the beds directly on concrete, this was not cooled concrete. This was um, just as it is concrete, but there was no detectable impact on the heat stress. Um, there, the milk production and the physiological status was the same, so there was not even a trend. Um, so we can conclude that the in our case, the conductive cooling we were seeing was because we were actively cooling the water, and it did take a lot of energy to cool the water, um, which is both a good and a bad thing. We were removing a lot of energy from the cows, which means it was benefiting them, but if this system were to be commercialized, you just have to figure out how are you going to cool as much water. Um, so second, the heat flow and condensation rates. Um, so I, we did collect some data with thermocouples and flux meters with the live cows, but it turns out that 1,200 pound cows are really hard on flux meters. So these things only lasted for a day or two out of the seven weeks before they were destroyed by the cows. So yeah. we, um, but we wanted to look at, there's a lot of companies that are promoting conductive cooling systems where you're cooling the concrete or you have a flat plate heat exchanger underneath the bedding, but then you need to have this eight or so inches of bedding on top of that to make a soft surface for the cow to lie on. So we wanted to look at, and there was also another study done at the, similar to ours, but they used a conductive cooling system with a thick bedding and they saw significantly less response. It was 0.15 degrees in the, um, Celsius instead of we had 1.1 degrees Celsius change in rectal temperature. So uh, we believe that the, heavy, that the thick amount of bedding was impeding the heat flow, but we wanted to test this. So, um, for, uh, so we did different treatments. We did um, quarter inch, one inch, three inch, and eight inch of both sand and sawdust. In every case, we used the water bed as a heat exchanger, but we simulated the thicker bedding systems by just putting a lot of bedding on top of the water bed. Um, then, there was a thermocouple glued to the surface of the rubber um, for e each of these, and then we put one in the center of the bedding if it was thick bedding, and then one at the surface of the bedding. And then the flux meter sat here. The heating pad was set to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and a sandbag was placed on top of the heating pad. Then um, I prepped for the experiment with the cows. We pressurized the water bed with about 1.5 feet of head, and then I backed off the pressure here so that when because the sandbag was 50 pounds, so it was not as heavy as a cow, we backed off the pressure. So we put the sandbag down, there was a little indention, um, but the water still could flow underneath. Uh, so this shows the live cows and the simulated cows. This live cow data is slightly different than what was uh, in the conference proceedings, but the, this table is in the conference proceedings. Uh, but it shows that the simulated cow agreed pretty well with the live cows um, when we, for this, um, for most of the data was taken at this 4.5, which is 40 degrees, also took some at the 10 degrees. Um, and even a little bit of this quarter inch or half a centimeter of the sawdust actually, okay, yeah, so in both cases the sawdust was impeding the heat flow. With the live cow experiment, we did apply this sawdust, but it didn't last very long. The cow tended to brush it off, so um, the live cow data actually agreed pretty well with the simulated cow with no bedding. Um, but this is what happens when you apply the thick bed. This is in centimeters, so this would be eight inches, and this is uh, three inches, one inch, and a half inch, and a quarter inch. Uh, so this is, I think, about 425 watts per meter squared of flux when you just had a thin amount of sawdust, and then 
once you had three inches of sawdust, there was no difference in the heat flow. This is 30 watts per meter squared, um, but that was the same whether or not we were cooled. So in this case, the surface temperature of the rubber mat was at about 40 degrees, but it was underneath enough sawdust that there was no detectable difference in how much heat flowed. Uh, so I think, and the sand did a little bit better, um, but there was still a 90% or more reduction in the amount of heat flux, even with eight inches of sand. So I think it's fair to conclude that if you want to see, and, and also comparing our physiological response to that of other studies, if you want to see the more dramatic results from conductive cooling, it has to be with some kind of a system where the cow is pretty close to the heat exchanger, not where the heat exchanger is underneath the thick bedding because that um, did not work so well. And um, so then this shows the condensation rate. So this is a, one of farmer's first questions like when we talk about these conductive cooling is what happens with condensation rate. Now there are, depending on the water temperature you pick and the ambient conditions um, will determine whether the, if the water temperature is below the dew point, then whenever the cow is not laying on the bed, the surface of the bed is going to get cool. And in our case, we did notice condensation in our experiment with live cows. We had quite a bit of issues with mastitis. I think more due to stall design than conductive cooling, we saw mastitis in control and experimental cows, and we didn't really have a big enough group to determine was there a correlation between the conductive cooling and the mastitis. So, um, but we did definitely observe that there was some condensation when we did the study with the live cows. So, uh, we wanted to look at you know, how much of a problem was this condensation. So, the ambient temperature here uh, was about 70 degrees Fahrenheit, so it was not warm enough to actually be as hot as it would be for heat stress. So if you did have a situation where it's 85 or 90 degrees Fahrenheit and you have the same 60 or 80 percent humidity, the dew point is higher. But the dew point for this was, I think this one is 17.5 degrees and then um, this one was 13 degrees for the dew point. So it was still, the dew point was high enough that we did see the condensation. Um, this shows so for the quarter inch, I sampled this just by collecting all of it from a square. And so I, I would let the system come to equilibrium, then I replaced the bedding, and then I immediately took samples in three locations, like duplicate samples on two beds, so it's uh, quite a few samples. Um, and those were dehydrated to determine moisture content, and then again two hours later, the same set was sampled. So then this shows the difference in a dry basis per hour. The water holding capacity of the sawdust was probably around 50% or more, and it was coming in at 30 or 40%, so it already had some moisture. For the sand, the water holding capacity was only 10%. So what ended up happening with these thin bedding treatments was for the sand, within four or five hours, it was saturated. And the sawdust didn't get saturated that fast, but it still obviously had a fair amount of condensation occurring. I, in this case, the temperature was getting below the dew point, and with a thin layer of bedding, the air has pretty free access to that surface. What then over here, this was underneath, so if the top three quarter inches was removed and then just sampling the bottom quarter inch. In this case, the bed surface is cold enough that condensation can occur, but what happens is when there's the inch of bedding on top, there's not a whole lot of airflow that's actually getting to the surface of the mat, so the condensation is greatly reduced. After several hours, it uh, was still able to be picked up, like you, it was, just a very small amount, but then if you let it go for eight hours or 24 hours, you would start to see that this was getting damp underneath here. But I think, at least in this study, it seemed that the rate of condensation was low enough that compared to the rate at which cows soil their bedding, it probably wasn't really an issue. The airflow, I think it was 0.1 meters per second. It wasn't a real high airflow. I did have missing fans, but I pointed them away from the bed, so there was some air circulation, but it wasn't like having it fan directly on that. So there's a lot of factors that are going to influence this dew point and airflow. Um, but I think it's fair to conclude that if you choose to use the small amount of bedding, you have to plan on having some moisture present. So some people use recycled sand or use dried manure and they incorporate antibacterials. I think, you know, if someone were talking to me about commercializing the system, I would definitely say if you use a thin amount of bedding, you need to think about the moisture content because expect to have some damp bedding. Um, if you, the, the thicker bedding, it may not, the condensation may be so slow, it's not really a problem. 
but then if it gets too thick, you won't have heat flow. So um, there is a question of how to optimize the thickness. And the other problem is that this is an idealized system. When you put down an inch of bedding, the cow's going to knock some off. And you know, so that's the other issue, like going from a research setting to a farm setting. Um, and then if for anything that was one inch, three inch, or eight inches, no matter what humidity, there was no sign of any condensation. It actually, the whole time, was drying out on the top surface. So the condensation was only a problem like on or near the surface of the bed where it was actually cold enough that it was below the dew point. Um, so finally, looking at the um, economic, this is a preliminary economic analysis. A lot of this data came from the 2003 study that's been quoted a lot. Um, so the highlights here, they estimated about approximately $40 per cow uh, per fan and then 93 watts to run the fan. The corral cooled, um, it, this is based on the capacity of the system, but it's harder to determine is how often the system is run at capacity. So if you look at the horsepower, you can calculate how many watts does it take to run this at you know, full capacity, but these are thermostatically controlled. So this could be an overestimate of the energy. More work needs to be done to figure out like actually how much, how intensively is the corral cool being run. This is, and then the conductive cooling, this is just a very preliminary estimate. Um, we had, I showed you, is about 600 watts per meter squared. The surface area of a cow inch is lying down is approximately one square meter, but in the case of our water bed, some part of the cow's stomach we can force the water out. So we, if we assume 25% of the cow's stomach was not cooled, um, then that would be about 450 watts that we were moving. And so if you had a coefficient of performance of three, which like a ground source heat cooling would be something like this, you would have 150 watts um, of energy. So then this is, all of this is at least for a 10 hour day. So, um, so anyway, if the corral cool is being used like its maximum energy intake, it could be higher than conductive cooling. This is all kind of preliminary, but the conductive cooling is somewhat in the same ballpark as corral cool according to this data. And this is the uh, water use data. Again, it's possible that this is an overestimate, but this is on their website what the system is capable of utilizing. Um, but as you see, the water cost is really kind of a non-issue compared to the electricity cost. So if people are interested in saving water, you can't really say, oh, you saved so much money on the extra water. Um, to, but you, do, you could eliminate sanitation concerns or you could be saving a scarce resource in many regions. And this effectiveness is just kind of a ballpark. So I think it's fair to say the conductive cooling is going to be more effective than fans only. Exactly where it falls with the fans, sprinklers, misters, soakers, continuum, or the corral cool. Um, I haven't completed this analysis, so I'm not confident yet in saying like how does it compare to these things. But um, there is some data in the literature on like what the effective THI reduction is for the corral cool. So the next phase is trying to uh, flesh out from our data on the conductive cooling, like what was the effective reduction in THI as far as the cows were concerned, if they were conductively cooled and comparing that with the corral cool. Um, so the conclusions, um, the conductive cooling system that we used with the water beds and with the cows directly in contact with that as a heat exchanger um, was effective and it compared to the cows that were heat stressed it, the milk production was 14 percent higher the feed intake was 23 percent higher the rectal temperature 1.1 degrees celsius and respiration rate uh, lowered by 22 breaths per minute there was both higher and lower heat stress so on the paper you'll see some um, if all the data is like combined, the low and lower and the higher, then it was 4% difference. So the uh, more dramatic results, though, came from focusing on the higher heat stress treatment. Um, the water beds placed directly on concrete did not have a measurable cooling impact. And we estimated that about a third of the cow's body heat was removed by conductive cooling while she was lying down. There is a lot of heat stress research, but it's harder to quantify like, how much heat are you moving because you can find these studies where they say, well, this is the equivalent reduction in THI, or this is how much more milk the cows made. But then if you turn a fan and sprinkler on, like how many watts are you removing on average is harder to determine. So this is kind of a first attempt at saying, here's how much watts you actually have to move from the cow to get a response. And in the case of the other study with the thick bedding, they estimated 30 watts that they were removing from the cow, but they got considerably less response than we did. 
Um, and our initial estimates are that conductive cooling is somewhat in the ballpark of corral cool for like cost to installation and maintenance and running. Um, so um, next week, I plan to do some IR imaging on a cow on the system, and so we get some more answers on like what is the effectively cooled surface area. Um, and then we're also currently working on a CFD model that will predict conduction under different um, flux, the conduction flux for different conditions, and could also be used to determine you know, if I use this water temperature with this dew point, would I expect to have the surface of the bed low enough to have condensation? If you were using warmer water, like if your dew point you know, is 60 degrees and your water is 70 degrees, then you wouldn't have an issue. So, you know, if the the only time the condensation will occur is when the surface of the bed is getting below the dew point of the air. But that is likely to happen in a high humidity situation. Um, and then um, I will do a more complete economic analysis of trying to estimate the installation costs, energy requirements, and potential economic benefits of conductive cooling. Um, so Professor Keith Gebermedin I was uh, the advisor for the project. Laura Dandenet and Kurt Gooch were a PI and co-PI on the project. Um, Professor Tom Overton is also a minor advisor. Joe, who is here, um, helped for several weeks in 2013 with feeding and milking cows. Um, and then Timothy Shelford um, also wrote the program for the instrumentation. And several other people from Cornell were also instrumental in helping with the research. So um, thank you, and I'll take any questions.